Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Gaming Theatrecom video. I'm sure you've heard of Brad Wardell. He is, of course, one of the leading pioneers, or at least one of those who is the most excited regarding DirectX 12. He's recently put together a blog post, I'll link to it in the video description, where he's gone into some details regarding his thoughts and opinions of DX12 so far. Now, we have, of course, heavily covered DX12 on the channel previously, and I'll link to that as well in uh, redgamingtech.com, so you can check that out in the video description. But he's gone over a couple of details regarding the performance of DX12, and he's making some rather bold claims. Now, he points out that so far Microsoft have released a couple of documents showing the profiles of the CPU and the render time um, using multiple cores of the games. Now, Currently, of course, the problem with DX11 is that most of the work is being done on one core. In other words, one core is issuing the, the draw calls to the GPU. Or, if you're not too familiar with what a draw call is, think of it as t saying to the, the GPU, the CPU telling the GPU, I need you to draw this box. I need you to draw this box. I need you to draw this box and then put this texture on this box. In other words, different objects have different number of draw calls depending on the complexity of the scene. So while it might sound like, say, 5,000 draw calls is a lot, just throwing a number out there, in reality, if you actually start to take apart an, a scene, how many objects can be inside that scene, and we're discussing here, for example, trees, we're discussing rocks, we're talking about pretty much everything draw calls can start getting gobbled up really quickly. So one of the problems is that in a single core, well, it's currently DX11, is really using a single core to do a lot of that work for it, and thus you're hitting performance barriers. But anyway, you, many of you probably know that, but I want to get you all onto the same page. So at the moment, uh, with the frame that they're using, um, in this particular example, it took around 9ms to render that particular <clears throat> part of the image, or that particular image. In DX12, it took considerably less. It went from 9ms down to 4ms, which is a rather large improvement to say the least. He then goes on to say that it should be the biggest, DX12 should be the biggest performance bump for those who utilize it we've ever seen. Now, obviously most of this, and he freely admits this, is going to be down to the developer and the game itself. But, he then says, Next time you watch Jurassic Park or The Phantom Menace, please realize that the CGI in these movies can be done in real time today. However, most graphics engines in games still render scenes very differently than the movies. That's because it's only recently it's been possible to create real-world fidelity in real time. <clears throat> but... A modern machine with DX12, or Mantle for that matter, could do real-time visuals in a game that is as good as you would say see in Lord of the Rings. Now, you will need to get away from the frame rate, as that's being a key metric on its own, unless we're comparing apples and apples. The DX12 slash Mantle-specific games will look unmistakably different from what we have today. What we have today is render uh, games in large frame and then you have to apply a bunch of post-process effects to it. In DX12 slash Mantle World, we'll render the images the same way we did in CGI in the past with a modern CPU slash GPU combo. With DX12, you could do parts of the Battle of Helm's Deep from Lord of the Rings in real time. Keep a very close eye on Unreal 4, Frostbite, Crytek, and of course, Nitrous engines. And that was pretty much all he said. Now, there are some parts here that do need to be translated before everyone starts jumping up and down in excitement. While most of that is pretty exciting stuff, there are some caveats. You're not going to be able to render the Lord of the Rings real-time on, let's say, a cheap $50 GPU. Let's just be totally honest here. Similarly, if you have the CPU that wouldn't look out of place from, say, 2005, you're also going to be kind of out of luck. We're talking very high-end, very expensive hardware here still. It's going to do that. Um, second little thing that we should point out is that one of the problems currently is that, obviously, a graphical scene often needs post-processing. What he's basically saying um, is with DX12, they'll be able to actually render the images with the effects in place. At least that's how I'm understanding this. So, in theory, it will take less time. 
Now, I'm sure that the Xbox One is going to be kind of becoming a thing. In other words, oh, people are going to say, well, how much of a difference is that going to make to the Xbox One? Honestly, it's far too early to say right now, but I don't think we're going to be looking at the same level of visual fidelity. It's worth remembering as well, the PS4 does have pretty damn low-level API access. Um, while we can't get an exact answer from developers, it would appear that they're pretty damn similar, the PS4 and the DX12 in terms of the low-level access. But it will, of course, be a large improvement to the Xbox One because its API currently isn't quite so low level as the um, PS4, despite the fact that there are some extensions, some low level extensions built into the Xbox One's API. We know that Microsoft have told us this. Um, they've released slides. We've looked at them. Blah blah blah, and it's pretty obvious. So. The big thing here is what it's going to be doing now for the PC. This is going to be really exciting stuff. There have been instances in the past with the PC where there were some rather large improvements to performance. But DX11 has really been a noose around the neck of the PC for some time. And well, to be fair, it started kind of at DX9. And then DX9 to 10, there were some improvements in DX10 uh, to 11. There were some further improvements, mostly on the way multi-threading worked with the API, but it hasn't really resolved the issue. There have been improvements, but you haven't really fixed the crux of the matter. With DX11, hopefully some of this stuff is going to change. Uh, sorry, with DX12, and what we're going to be seeing is much better performance. It's really going to allow the GPU to really open up, and hopefully within the next couple of years when the GPU is really... Um, are able to fully take advantage of DX12 and developers really understand what the hell they're doing, it's going to make an even greater uh, performance increase to what we can imagine. As I've mentioned earlier, there have been times in the PC's history where there have been rather large jumps in visual fidelity. One of the obvious ones would be the original Voodoo slash early 3D accelerator cards. Now, not all games really looked incredible. For example, if you were to take a look at Quake, the software rendered version of Quake, yes, it looks better um, when you jump to fr when you jump to the Glide version of Quake. It does look better than software, but it's not what I'd consider to be amazingly better. There are some improvements on, say, lighting. There's high resolution and so on, but it's not like it's an entirely new game. But if you were to look at another title, say Tomb Raider, software rendered, and then you were to jump over to Glide. Or equivalent, in other words, you were to use like a mini driver, it looks really that much more impressive and it pretty much smashes anything that was about at the time, at least in my personal opinion. I thought Tomb Raider, the original Tomb Raider on the PC, looked incredible. Um, there was impressive, very impressive lighting. It basically looked like a PS1 version, but even more impressive because what it did is it actually increased the resolution, it improved the lighting, and so on and so forth, and it looked so much better. Um, in some sections, actually, the software rendered version of Tomb Raider looked pretty abysmal. Um, the lighting and the textures and so forth were absolutely awful. They were pretty bad. Um, if we were to also move forward a little bit, actually quite a, li quite a bit forward, um, to the original GeForce cards and also the Radeons, that type of thing, when um, we started to move towards uh, hardware TNL, hardware triangle lighting setup, where of course the GPU was now doing most of the triangle lighting rather than the CPU needing to do it. Um, we started to see this really on the uh, in the early Quake era, um, for example, Quake Three, but other titles as well. You know, when you started to need a, a card that was capable of hardware TNL setup. You could start seeing the quite improve, large improvements in visual fidelity when it comes to, let's say, the triangles and the, uh, the actual geometry on screen and the actual lighting. That's when the GPU was able to start offloading that from the CPU. And another example of large improvement in of um, large improvements or to performance would definitely be, at least in my personal opinion, um, let's say the 8800 uh, GTX or the NVIDIA's kind of early unified architecture, which was very similar to what AMD were using as well. Um, massive improvements in performance because obviously, rather than having a pipeline which was, rather than having a unit which was specifically for vertex shading or for pixel shading or whatever, 
who instead had unified shaders, and so those shaders could do whatever the job was. And it was really awesome. It, it made quite a large difference in performance because what you would get is rather than a case where, say, <clears throat> just for example, you were pixel shading bound and, uh, you know, it didn't really require that much geometry in a particular scene. And so the geometry um, part of the pipeline was, was not doing that much. It wasn't working flat out, yet the pixel shaders were able to keep up. What you get now is unified model where the GPU is much better able to actually control its own performance. And so just to give an example, let's say you have, um, I don't know, you could have like 30 shaders working on geometry and you could have another 30 working on vertex and then you could have the remainder working on pixel or it could change and it could be like 45 on geometry and so on and so forth. And these type of things were ra rather large improvements in terms of performance. Um, so obviously with the X12, um, it definitely has the potential for the PC. I'm, I don't want to take anything away from the Xbox One version because it's still really early. I think there definitely will be some improvements in, in terms of the way the console is able to handle certain things. And I think it will be definitely a CPU type of performance increase as well. Hopefully we'll be seeing extra objects on screen. And that could lead to some rather interesting differences between the PS4 and the Xbox One iterations of software because obviously the Xbox One does have a CPU lead in terms of raw clock speed so if it is more efficient when it comes to the uh, draw calls and actually being multi-threaded anyway in terms of the API that could possibly start transitioning to the um, to the games themselves, whereas on the other hand, obviously at the moment the Xbox One does have a golf in terms of the GPU performance anyway, so it's possible, and obviously it's far too early to know, only Microsoft uh, really know this, or maybe some key developers as well who are working on both um, machines and have access to DX12 code, what we could actually have is how um, maybe the PS4 version runs at slightly higher resolution, but the Xbox One version maybe has access to certain other uh, performance improvements. But for PC, it's going to be extremely interesting how all of this works. Um, and I don't think necessarily even the first batch of DX12 games is going to be really the thing. And as Brad Wardell says himself, it's going to really come down to the game itself. Um... It could be an instance where, let's say, a cl more enclosed corridor shooter, it might not have as much of a great impact as, let's say, a more open world game. And by open world, let's say, I don't know, the new Elder Scrolls. Like, that theoretically could really benefit because of the size of the environments. And obviously, if you've got two trees, it doesn't really require um, as many draw calls if they're the same as if they're completely and utterly different. So let's say you have one that's kind of gnarled up and dead, and, you know, that tree looks, let's call that tree A. You have tree B that looks kind of lively and healthy, uh, healthy and living. So let's just call those two, you know, tree A and tree B. But if you that's going to require more draw calls than, say, draw, uh, let's say, tree A if it was duplicated a couple of times. It requires considerably fewer draw calls if you have objects that look pretty similar. So what what a lot of the games are doing now, of course, is you're starting to get definitely the air of the clone brush a lot of the time. One reason is to save time, but it's also to save performance as well. So that's kind of like a whole thing. So it's going to be very interesting to see what we start seeing in terms of fo uh, foliage and fauna and... Um, maybe even different levels of animation uh, in terms of what they can stop freeing up because obviously if they manage to free up uh, CPU resources regarding this then that CPU resource is going to maybe have improvements on artificial intelligence. From what we understand AI is starting to move towards more compute stuff anyway. Anyway, most of this stuff to be honest is a lot of speculation because as I said DX12 is still being worked on and we do know that DX12 is going to be of course, a thing with Windows 10. It's still, as far as I'm, I'm aware, it's still ambiguous whether it's actually going to pop up on, uh, say, Windows 8. Whether it's going to work on Windows 8. Some are saying it's not going to work on Windows 8 and below. Others are saying it probably will work on Windows 8. I personally wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. I personally think that Microsoft are trying to. I wouldn't exactly say. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't think they would admit this. But I think they're trying to tie a uh, relationship, like, just cut it off with DX8, uh, sorry, Windows 8, because I don't think that many gamers really um, embraced Windows 8 that well. 
Anyway, guys, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. It's been a bit of a kind of speculative, um, ranty type of video, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Take care and bye for now.